Madam Chair, I'm, I'm loving this hearing. I really appreciate your putting it together. Uh, uh, a little bit of background. Uh, I spent most of my adult life in energy. I've worked in, uh, I've made my living in hydro, biomass, energy efficiency, and wind. So this is, uh, this is uh, very familiar to me. Uh, first thing I, I want to say is I, I want to match, I want to see Senator Cassidy's video and raise him by a map. <laughs> And the map is called Nobody maps. Lives. The map is called <laughs> Nobody Lives Here. Forty-seven percent of the census tracts in the United States are have zero population. I urge him if he thinks we're out of room for solar and wind projects to look down when he's flying home to Louisiana tonight. Uh, to say that there's no place for these projects to go, just you know, as much as I love the senator from Louisiana, that just doesn't pass the straight face test. Secondly, my experience in energy is there's no free lunch. Every form of energy has some drawbacks, some questions, some cost, uh, whether it's environmental or economic, uh, and I understand that. It seems to me that, though, that Senator Heinrich's last question, there's several really important goals here. One is storage. Storage unlocks enormous potential for renewables. And by the way, the other place Senator Castillo to look is in the Gulf of Mexico. The offshore wind is enormous potential, higher capacity factor, higher uh, efficiency, larger turbines, less environmental impact, less neighbors impact. So enormous potential, but storage unlocks huge potential for solar and wind. Number two is efficiency. The cheapest, most cleanest kilowatt hour of all is the one that isn't used. My experience in the energy efficiency business is the problem is energy efficiency investments have insufficient return in and of themselves at a fairly low energy cost. There has to be some subsidy. My suggestion is that utilities could pay customers to do energy efficiency, which would lower their cost of acquiring new power. In other words, new energy efficiency is a megawatt, if you will. Uh, Carbon capture, I think, is also critical. We have this huge coal resource. We have huge energy resources. Carbon capture has got to be part of the future, it seems to me. Um, number four is nuclear. I agree with you, Mr. Bryce. I, I think the, the problem I have is, and, and you, you said something that sort of piqued me, right now it's not affordable. I mean, it just isn't. The cost per megawatt of installing a new nuclear plant is just not comparable to even for, to any other technology. and sitting next to this lady, we've got to figure out what to do with the waste. It's not responsible for our generation to say we're going to solve our climate problem by building nuclear plants and we're going to let you guys and our children and grandchildren deal with, with, with the waste. This, this government made a commitment to dealing with waste 70 years ago. They haven't done it. And that's one of my problems with going whole hog into nuclear, but I do think clearly the new generation, if it comes smaller, scalable, uh, uh, th th those kinds of solutions are important. Uh, number five for me is research and innovation. Got it. That, we've all agreed on that. The, 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 the shale revolution, in part, came out of research at the Department of Energy. And if we can have similar research that brings us innovations like that in batteries, we're in business. I mean, that's a, that, that's a big deal, and I think we need to uh, appreciate that. And then finally, the point you all have made, and if you can find a question in here, by the way, you're welcome to it. Uh, number five is it does have to be an international solution. CO2 doesn't respect boundaries, uh, and, and if we do everything we possibly can, which I think we should, but India and China don't, then we're still not going to solve this problem. And by the way, to put a fine point on the problem, we're now at 410 parts per million of CO2. First time in three million years we've been there. And the last time we were there, the oceans were 60 feet higher. I mean, to me, that sort of captures where, where we are. Uh, so uh, I, I think you know we've got to be talking about all of these things. Um, I'm, I'm a little bit worried about a, a carbon tax. Because my fear is that a carbon tax would be just high enough to be annoying and not high enough to change behavior. All the data I've seen is people, and we've lived through it, people aren't going to stop driving until gas goes up a dollar or two a gallon. And nobody's talking about a carbon tax that would have that level of increase. 
and yet we would be taking, it's a regressive tax in a sense that we'd be taking out of consumers. Uh, you found a question, answer it. <laughs> Senator King, we were waiting for that yeah. question. Well, I figured if we I threw enough out We were gonna give you a, there, a little extra time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, okay, you found all right, it go, go for it. I was just gonna offer two really quick things. Yes, you're right, that's a well put concern about a carbon tax. It can't do everything and it can do some things and you can, you can design it to not be regressive. The most regressive thing about climate change is the impacts. That is absolutely the case. Everything else you can sort of design to be a little bit better. And I think your point on global leadership is really important. I think if we use empirical evidence about why we're doing something and other people aren't, to block action, it doesn't make answering the problem any easier. It, no, and that's and why it, leaving the Paris Climate Accord was a disaster, because it, that, that at least was global leadership. It was non-binding, but at least put us out there with the rest of the world, and now we're saying to them, we're not worried about it. You don't have to worry about it. Anyway, thank you, Mr. Madam Chair.